Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for watching this video. Um, my name is Kelly Sherman. I am a senior public health science major at University of Maryland School of Public Health. Um, I'm doing pretty well, and I'm very excited to have this opportunity to connect with fellow students and friends to talk with Dr. Carlton, Professor um, Bynum, and Ms. McClure, and Dean Lushniak this evening, or afternoon. I'm so sorry. Um, but thank you, everyone who's watched the previous live chats. And also, just as a quick reminder, we're going to have a summer schedule going forward. So that means that we're going to be having two more sessions during the summer, one in July and one in August. But before we get started today, could Dean Leshniak talk to us about the current state of COVID and just speak specifically to different health disparities that are happening with COVID? Great, thank you so much, Kelly. And, and thank you, Dr. Green and Dr. Smith Bynum for being here and uh, Ms. McClure, Aaron uh, as well for joining us here. I think we're gonna have a very vibrant discussion. As we've been doing each and every week, uh, this is uh, my time as the Dean of the School of Public Health to give you sort of the rundown of what's been happening in COVID-19. And as always, uh, I'll, I'll give you what are numbers. And, and, you know, I always preface this by saying, you know, numbers aren't just numbers. What we realize behind those numbers is a person, is a family, is a community, is, is a region, is a nation. And so I don't want this to be sort of flippant that I'm just giving you sort of the, 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 the sterile stats. What I'm doing you is telling you that the COVID-19 pandemic continues. Uh, it is still rampant throughout the world and we as public health people need to be braced for so many repercussions associated with this. Uh, right now, over 7.2 million people worldwide have been diagnosed as of this morning with COVID-19. Uh, of that, uh, 412,000 people have died to this. And, and our hearts go out to those individuals who have suffered illness, who have suffered death and, and, and their families that are, that are now going through a mourning process, but also our whole world that has suffered both the economic repercussions and now, as we'll discuss today, the racist repercussions that come with this pandemic. In the United States, we are nearing now over nearly 2 million cases. We're at 1.98 million people. I always remind you that on, you know, in January is when we had case number one in the United States that made news. And now we're at 1.98 million with uh, over a little over 112,000 people who have died from COVID-19. Uh, the United States remains an epicenter of activity. And as I mentioned last week, both Brazil, Russia, and the United Kingdom are also hot areas where things continue. Uh, today, we're going to take a little different approach, I think, in terms of not just talking about COVID-19, but once again, reminding you, as we did a few sessions ago when we had uh, Dr. Stephen Thomas on from the Maryland Institute for Applied Environmental Health, the idea that with, along with COVID-19 comes a realization that we've had a disproportionate burden, burden of illness and death among racial and ethnic minority groups. Uh, recently, the CDC reported, and, and you know, mind you, we started with the idea that the reports were coming in without any demographics, right? Without the don't know, notation of what were the races involved, what were the characteristics involved. We were simply doing male, female, and age. And I think what we've come to realize is that's not an approach where we need to, you know, we need to give more information is the correct approach. Uh, and, and the recent CDC report found definitely overrepresentation of hospital, hospitalized Black and Hispanic uh, patients, uh, and that identified de death for uh, race and ethnicity uh, that were substantially higher than in white or Asian persons. Uh, there's further work going on to collect and analyze more data and understand and reduce the impact of COVID-19 on the health of racial and ethnic minorities. What we know is something we've been stressing all along from a public health perspective is, you know, where we live, where we learn, where we work and where we play contribute to our health. And with systemic inequalities, differing levels of health risks, needs and outcomes, all this emerges, especially in light of a pandemic such as this. We're facing right now a double pandemic. It's the coronavirus COVID-19 that we've been talking about for the last few, few months. And now coming to a head is, is racism, which some people are, donating, uh, are designating as COVID-1619, which happens to be the year that racism came to America 
uh, along with slavery and the history that's created in inequitable living conditions, work environments and policies and health conditions and in inequality in care. I also wanted to note that today we're proud to jointly support both as a school of public health, but also as a University of Maryland College Park, the hashtag shutdown academia. This is an initiative designed to highlight the need for all of us to be out there to confront anti-Black racism and our unconscious biases and, and to work for equality and opportunity to champion the diversity that exists around us and inclusion in colleges and university. And this also includes hashtag shutdown STEM, which is specific to highlight the need for diversity in STEM disciplines and particular challenges that, that Black academics and professionals face with, within these disciplines. Our approach to this is to bring this to, to the forefront, to have this discussions, not just today, uh, but each and every day. And so uh, we'll be discussing today uh, racism as a public health emergency uh, in this live cast and, and uh, building a community for anti-racist action. So thank you to our guests who are here today and we're eager to have a vibrant, uh, maybe a difficult discussion maybe something that we don't open ourselves to neither listen or to talk about often enough. And, and obviously this stum stems from a murder and that's the murder of George Floyd a few weeks ago, uh, you know, in Minneapolis, we all know about it, but it goes beyond that individual. That individual woke us up, right? That's what happened, right? And now what we're seeing is we're seeing the rage, the concern, the, 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 uh, approach of, of marching in the streets, right, of bringing this. And this is an opportunity for us to, to continue this, both at the School of Public Health and at the University of Maryland College Park for discussion. So thank you, Kelly. Of course. Thank you, Dean Leshniak, for those words. And just going off of what you said, we are in the midst of not one, but two pandemics, COVID-19 and racism. And COVID has disproportionately impacted Black and Brown communities and expose the different structural inequities that underlie like health disparities for a long time, not just the past six months, and violence against Black people and communities rooted in our country's legacy of white supremacy and institutionalized racism. After the horrific murder, murder of George Floyd by the Minneapolis police officers, along with the deaths of so many others in the weeks and years before, people throughout the US and throughout the world have risen up to challenge racism, white supremacy, and demand for justice and big structural changes. While people have been fighting for justice for years, the energy and momentum of this movement is greater now than many of us have ever seen in our lifetimes. I know, especially in my lifetime. Many of our UMG students, faculty, and staff are actively engaged in scholarship and activism focused on fighting racism, injustice, and discrimination. And others may just wanna educate themselves on issues and get involved in some way, but not really know where to begin. As an institution, we've had our own challenges and tragedies that show that we have so much work to do to root out racism and make our campus a place where all can thrive. We must continue to say their names, Lieutenant Richard Collins III and Jordan McNair. We are very grateful to have the opportunity to have three incredible university leaders joining us today who all play a role in advancing diversity, inclusion, and equity on our campus. Dr. Maya smith Brynham is an associate professor in the Department of Family Science and in the School of Public Health. Dr. Carlton Green is the Director of Diversity Training and Education for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And Aaron McClure is the Chief of Staff for the School of Public Health and the Diversity Officer for the School of Public Health. I welcome you all and thank you for taking the time to engage in a conversation about the moment we're in and to just share your perspective on how we can all move forward together. I'd love for you all to introduce yourself and just reflect on the events in the most recent weeks because I know my two sentences talking about you does not give you due justice. But if we could start with uh, Dr. Smith Bynum, that would be perfect. Hi, thank you so much, Kelly, um, and for your comments as well. Um, my name is Mia Smith Bynum, and um, I've been at the University of Maryland since um, January 2010. Um, I've been doing research on African American kids and mental health um, and parenting for the past 20 years. And one of the things I focused on specifically is how African American parents prepare their kids for some of the things that have been going on in the news right now. And I'm a clinical psychologist by training. 
Thank you. And then Dr. Green, could you introduce yourself as well? Sure, thank you all so much for having me. We're really grateful to be engaged in this conversation with you all. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, I'm Carlton Green. Um, I am the Director of Diversity Training and Education here in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Maryland. Um, like Dr. Maria Smith-Bynum, I'm also a psychologist, but a counseling psychologist by training. Um, I was a, um, a staff psychologist in the University Counseling Center for about five years before taking on this role. Um, in this role, what I do is really try to provide um, expertise and training when it comes to issues of diversity. Um, and inclusion on our campus um, under the leadership of our Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Georgina Dodge. Um, a part of the way that I'm always approaching this work is trying to get people to not only think about how bias plays out or what inclusion means, but also what are some of the barriers that stand in the way of, a, of us actually being able to have the inclusive communities that we want to be um, participating in. I think if we can learn more about the barriers and how we can navigate those, then that becomes really significant to helping us to move forward. And so hopefully today that, that, that'll be some of the perspective that I'll bring to the conversation. Thank you. And Ms. McClure, could you introduce yourself as well? You're on mute, one second. <laughs> I'm that person, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I'm trying to mute my dog that's whiny. Um, my name's Erin, I use she and her pronouns. Um, the diversity officer in the School of Public Health and Chief of Staff, as you shared, um, I bring 15 years of higher education administrative experience and another close to 15 in um, social services and social work background. I incorporate my intergroup dialogue and social justice training to facilitate discussions on issues of race, sexuality, gender, and additional identities with an intersectional approach. Uh, I speak directly to white, cisgender, heteronormative identities and challenge the social and systemic institutionalized and internalized practices and structures that center these false norms. So today specifically, I'm here to speak to the centering of whiteness um, and the importance of centering the lives and experience of black people and folks of color who have been historically bearing the burden of racial oppression um, and helping our leaders and our faculty, staff and students and engaging in these difficult conversations of issues of equity and justice um, and, and enacting um, equitable and inclusive practices um, that actually truly um, resonate with the visions and the values and the missions that we that we hold um, in our school and on campus. And I'm proud to do this work and be in community with you all and the many ways that our folks are showing up in the School of Public Health and on campus. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I just want to go in a less formal way and just ask you guys all, how are you doing right now? And I know that's such a broad question, but just if you guys can give a touch or give a light into what's been on your mind recently before we dive into questions. Can I just, can I refocus the question maybe a little bit? Yeah. Um, Kelly? Yeah, because one of the things that, you, it's, a, it's a really loaded question, right? Um, so I'm going to do something that I kind of have been practicing with people as I've been having conversations with them in consultation across um, campus really is um, kind of refocusing the question and saying and asking people, how is your body doing, right? Um, it kind of narrows the focus a little bit and it sort of like gets us in talking to talking a little bit about um, some mind body awareness, which I think is really critical to doing sort of like anti-racism work. So Mia and Aaron and Boris, how is your body doing? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I was just uh, in a, a meeting with my faculty colleagues about um, like doing the work of anti-racism and, you know, I study um, uh, institutionalized racism. That's my, one of my key areas of focus. And so I think about it a lot. I live as a black woman in the United States, so it's always there, but I felt like the last 10 days or so, it's been racism around the clock. Um, and so you kind of think, hey, I'm always thinking about it, but it's been activated in some ways that um, feel different. And I've had to really kind of consciously um, pace myself with the work that we're doing to ramp up our capacity. And so um, I think uh, I have already had some coping skills built in around this because you sort of have to. Um, so I have been able to maintain some distance, but um, it, it's challenging and it's hard.
Boris, do you want to say? Yeah, you know, from from I think it's a great way, way to sort of start this because you know immediately I, I sort of say, well, my body is doing it's doing okay, but my body I'm finding is is getting tired. You know, and it's not tired necessarily from physical activity. I'm trying to get my exercise in. I'm trying to, but you know, it's kind of weird that, you know, by 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night, I feel like my body is ready, right, to rest. It, it's, it's that early. And I realize, you know, uh, Dr. Green, that, that your question really poses this idea of how my mind is interspaced with my body. That in essence, this isn't a separation. So when I look at all the stressors, and the stressors are much different this last couple of weeks than they were the weeks before, right? I was 110 miles an hour going into COVID and, and doing the work both at the School of Public Health and University of Maryland. Now it's gotten much more complicated. Mm. And my body, I think, is, is getting racked up, right? It's getting racked up because there's a million things going on and I don't know where to turn. Mm. It's a little bit, I was going to say my body is a little frenzied, if that makes sense. And I'm holding all of these various emotions at different times for myself, my family, my colleagues, my friends, all of that. Um, but what I'm trying to do, as I think you're trying to model for us, Dr. Green, is um, awareness of those emotions. And then I, in, in many ways, try to release those emotions so that they're not just all being held in and um, that I can stand in the space with those, but then I let some of those go or use those for action or activism or care. Or in some ways, Dr. Me and I have talked radical um, expression and action. Um, and so I, I'm trying to harness all of those and not feel held down by those and actually feel activated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As for me, I thank you for sharing that, Aaron. I think that um, the thing that I'm most aware of these days is like really feeling tired, feeling really exhausted um, and thinking about that, not only in the context of COVID-19 and being at home like 24 hours a day and not really getting um, to the office, you know, which today I did come into the office to do this, um, but just thinking about um, being home and being almost confined to that space um, it's not a space that's really conducive to like getting across campus and walking and sort of like really getting some energy into, to, into the body. So I have to be really mindful of that. Um, so my body is really, really tired. Um, while also, uh, I, I, I say that while also saying, I do think like Dr. Mia Smith-Bynum, I also have some, some good coping strategies in place that are sort of like energizing me. But when it time comes time to do the work, I'm very much aware of, so like, ooh, yeah, this is really heavy right now. And it's sitting on my chest a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Green, for one, sharing, and also rephrasing the question, because I think that's a lot more, like, better to understand, like, how people are feeling, like, now, and just, like, being in touch with their body, um, and also it's a better response instead of a quick good. Um, so just going into different things that we could discuss today in our session, I want to first reach out to everyone who's watching please feel free to comment down questions um, that you would want us to discuss or things that you'd want to clarify or anything. And we'd be happy to get to them and we'll have a question and answer period at the end, but don't hesitate to ask any questions that you might have. Um, I guess before we get into things, there are a few key terms that I would love to discuss and just understand what they actually are. So my first question is, what is racism and what does it mean to be anti-racist? So Mia, am I gonna take the lead on to like the racism question? Okay, great. <laughs> so I'm gonna just share my screen here as a way of getting us into the conversation. I think that there are lots of different ways that we could talk about racism and there are lots of different scholars who are writing about this. Um, with the, one of the ways that I wanted to lift it up, especially thinking about being in the School of Public Health is a definition that I heard from Dr. Kamara Jones, who's a former president of the American Public Health Association. And she's now um, at Harvard University, but she offers a definition that I heard from her talking in a podcast. Um, uh, it wasn't a podcast, I always say that, a news show uh, on WBUR, but up in Boston on, on point. And the topic of the conversation was, should Milwaukee declare racism a public health crisis? And this was sometime last year. 
And as she was talking, one of the, as one of the guests on the, on the show, she kind of gave this definition. And I think that it fits perfectly for us to be able to enter into this conversation, sometimes for people who have really academic understandings of it, but then for people who have no awareness of what racism is, it offers a really grounding way of being in the conversation. And so she says, what is racism? It's a system. It's not a personal moral failing. It's not even a psychiatric illness. It's a system of power and it's a system of doing two things, of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. And it does those things based upon so-called race, based upon the social interpretation of how we look, right? And I think that that's really, really profound in thinking about how our society can oftentimes structure opportunity in favor of certain groups. And in this case, if we're talking about racism, how, it's favor how it structures opportunity in favor of white people and actually limits opportunity or takes away opportunity from people of color because of, uh, because of structural issues. And then if you really think about this, um, I, I think a brilliant way of, of that, that she's added to this is about how we assign value to people. And if you go and look at um, uh, sort of like how we, we were starting this conversation thinking about what happened in Minneapolis, right? So you've got this white police officer with his neck on the, with his knee on the neck of a black person. And people are just sort of like standing around because inherent in a racist system, it, it communicates to us that this black person laying on the crown is actually not of value, right? And this white person with his knee on the neck of this black person is actually a pretty powerful person who gets the respect of everybody staying around to the degree that nobody even says anything about what this person is doing, right? That's how power functions. Um, it really um, limits or uh, takes away value. And in this case, from black bodies, while giving a lot of power to white bodies that are allowed to do whatever it is that they want to, want to do without question, right? So that's one definition that I would that I would want us to be offering up and thinking about how do we talk about um, how we talk about racism. Do you want to add something to that, Mia? <laughs> Dr. Green, I have a little tag team thing going on here. So um, what I would add to that and what um, uh, is important is I like to say that racism is built into the walls. Um, it's built into the air um, that all of us, including African-Americans and other people of color, that we are all socialized into these systems of power and a lot of the work that I do with, with Black parents and, and, and individuals who parent Black children is helping um, to shield kids from this narrative. So when I say it's built in the walls in the air, it's in our cultural imagery um, that limits uh, the view of African Americans as only being able to be athletes, um, athletes or criminals, for example, and that uh, um, the racial stereotypes that were created about of black people when they were enslaved at the beginning, early years of our country that um, as slavery began to be um, condemned around the world, um, the power structures, the people that hold power, um, wealthy uh, white landowners who are politicians, they created these stereotypes um, in order to justify um, the continuation of slavery. And what's so powerful today is those stereotypes formed so long ago are still with us. And so, um, What's happened with, as, as we've seen the, these cell phone videos seep into our public discourse and really um, uh, uh, bring into full awareness with, um, with uh, Mr. Floyd's murder is um, these ideas of, well, he must have done something wrong to uh, justify the behavior. Oh, well, the person was smoking marijuana and so they um, deserve the death that they received without due process under the law. That the power of those stereotypes um, when unexamined, because they're literally built into the walls, um, it helps support these systems of power. And so those systems of power, the cultural imagery, um, uh, um, the wealth, right? So it's, it's like a combination of wealth, prejudicial beliefs, and the power that comes from that to set policy. Um, uh, when you look at the composition of our governments, whether you're talking about state, federal, um, or local, um, who, whose ideas, whose norms get to set those. That's where I say it gets built in the wall. And so it forms a bedrock of those prejudicial beliefs. And then that in turn reinforces the um, justification for discriminatory behavior. So it's all connected. Um, and without some critical examination, it's very easy for these systems to, con to continue. Yeah, 
I would just add to that too, uh, Mia, that I think that what, you know, even if we think about COVID-19, right, um, how uh, this, this sort of like assigning value piece really played out um, tr tremendously when it first um, became um, an issue in this country, right? We were looking at black people and saying that black people weren't taking it seriously, right? So it's really about saying something about black people groups or people of color groups, we were blaming them, right? And then it shifted to, well, you know, if people of color are, are getting it, it's because they have these pre-existing conditions or they've got some health issues that are going on that sort of like, that, that predispose them, right? Which also says something about um, how we value people of color bodies in this country, really thinking about them as being weaker um, in some ways as being not necessarily able to, um, not having strong enough immune systems, like really thinking about the, the, the deficiencies in black bodies, right? And then moving in there um, to, without even really paying attention to the structural policy related issues that, that really set up people of color communities to be predis I mean, exposed to um, the virus or to, or to be contracting it at higher levels, right? Um, and so that, that inability to shift the conversation to think about policies and practices becomes really important. And then the other thing is really um, about uh, thinking about the, the, sh the screen shifted. Sorry about that. It kind of caught me off guard. Um, the other thing that, um, that I think Dr. Mia Smith Bynum is pointing towards is that, you know, we, we can all have biases, but it's when your biases operate with the power and authority of the local, of laws, of policies, of courts, of criminal justice systems, of educational administrators, when your biases work with the power that those systems have, right? That's when we get sort of like this, this disfavorable system that operates um, to the detriment of people of color communities, but also operate in favor of trying to set up white communities to have access to more resources. Right, right. And a lot of um, Americans that, that the true history of racism in America is not taught well in K through 12. So it really depends on where you are in the country, the composition of your school district, what education you get. And so um, it reinforces this notion that things are actually better that they are, than they are, that the civil rights movement sort of like brought things in, in, into an equitable alignment, or in some cases completely flipped it, that the evidence just doesn't bear that out. Um, and so one of the things we try to do um, uh, once our students get to Maryland um, is to infuse the education that we provide them with, with more information about just the, the sheer um, number of systemic blockades put into place to um, help African Americans recover from uh, slavery. So we didn't get the 40 acres in the mule, you didn't get the GI Bill, um, you didn't get to access um, housing um, and law, law, uh, loans, housing loans at the same way that that white Americans did at the time. Sometimes even when you served overseas, you were not permitted to do so. So when you repeat those patterns um, over generations, over and over and over again, that's how you get the wealth gap. Um, uh, you see um, a limited imagery of African Americans' popular culture, um, uh, as, as Dr. Green mentioned, education. It's, a, it's an entire system and it, and it has very, very long and deep roots and it goes back many generations. So I could go on and on about it. We should probably go to another question. <laughs> no, no, Dr. Smith Bynum, actually going off of what you were saying about the education piece, I was just wondering how can we address these issues within a classroom setting, even if there are different disparities K through 12? So I would say just focusing on higher ed. Um, one, of the, So I'm a psychologist, which is a behavioral or social science. Um, I, in myself, I've had to learn a lot of the history at a granular level. So to teach about African-American families for any students who are watching, that's Family Science 420, um, I've had to make sure that I incorporate enough of that early history so that, that um, the social ills that we see African-American families face today, that is grounded in some type of particular context, that a lot of times what happens is those stereotypes are so powerful they say, oh, where they're lazy or they're poor and they're not hardworking. And that's why they're um, in the conditions that they are when there's decades of research that show that, no, that's actually not the case. But you've got to explain the history to, in order to connect the dots. And so all of us as educators, when we're talking about um, racial health disparities um, in our college or we're talking about issues over in, in the social sciences and Vsauce across campus or in RHU, um, Arts and Humanities, that really helping students to see 
how many generations these things go back and what kinds of policies were put into place, removed that help to maintain that status quo. Um, and then students, uh, it's, we have a wonderful research library. Um, there's the, all kinds of resources to avail yourself of and to take advantage of groups um, like the one that Aaron McClure runs where um, students can go and be in dialogue with other students. Um, to me, one of the hallmarks of an undergraduate education is the sheer diversity of the campus. There are people from all over the world and just taking that, stepping out on that courage and knowing that there are gonna be professionals there to help open up that space and to have an effective dialogue. Um, those are things that I think are really in, important. For faculty colleagues, head on over to TLTC. You may have to do it virtually for a period of time, but they um, have wonderful uh, resources. I took one of those workshops with Dr. Green um, just this past fall, and that was also really helpful in um, some of the changes I've been making to my own teaching. Yeah, I'll just add to that. And I'd love to hear Aaron talk about this, especially being a, a dialogue instructor about how it is that we could be thinking about doing more of this work in the classroom. Um, I would echo uh, some of what um, Dr. Mia smith Bonham is talking about when we think about, um, I'll, maybe I'll start here. As a psychologist, one of the things that we talk about in helping professionals um, or in helping professions with psychology and teaching really are, is that you have to think about yourself as being the most important instrument that you would be using in the delivery of uh, teaching or in the delivery of, 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 of um, any type of human service that you are um, working in. So if you think about that, then you have to sharpen this instrument. It means that you have to have a, a, a certain degree of self-awareness to be able to enter into the conversation around race and racism. We know, you know, as Boris was pointing out, Dean Lushniak was pointing out at the beginning, um, we all kind of get socialized not to talk about race, not to talk about racism. And because of that socialization, um, entering into the conversation brings up a lot of anxiety for people. And what we know is, is that when people experience that anxiety, um, it, that can trigger a whole lot of different sort of like reactions that we see actually manifesting in our, in our relationships or in the classroom or how we actually respond to race and to racism. People get defensive, people start crying, people get silent. Um, there, there are just so many different ways that people um, respond to it. So getting into a place where you can acknowledge that, um, and maybe this is a good way of thinking about it, uh, right now, Ibram X. Kendi and his book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, uh, one of the, the primary quotes from that book, he says is that denial is the heartbeat of racism, right? So if we deny that we have racism in us, or we deny that racism is a system that functions in the world, then what we're actually doing is giving life to racism. Right, we actually strengthen its capacity for being able to disfavor people of color and continue to structure opportunity in favor of white people. Um, so being able to move out of place of denial and actually admitting that racism is a thing and it's a thing that operates systemically and also interpersonally and intrapersonally within us is a huge first step for, for, um, for faculty. And to recognize that um, your competence is not on the line if you actually move into a place of admitting that racism is a thing or that you are somebody who could say a racist comment or commit a racist behavior, right? Your competence is not on the line. You still have your PhD. You're still the faculty of record of that course. It just means that you have an increased awareness around how race and racism functions. And with that increased awareness, you actually become a little bit more, in, a little bit more competent at being able to do your job. So self-awareness self is one of the first things. Um, Aaron, do you wanna talk about some pieces around how um, the words of engagement and group dialogue course really sets people up to talk about race and racism in the context of that class. Yes, absolutely. So um, this seven week course um, that our students uh, can participate in is a one credit academic course. It's rooted in both head and heart action. Um, so we have that headspace where we have these core foundational pieces uh, that, that bring knowledge, that bring awareness, um, that are rooted in um, academe, but also rooted in, you know, um, critical thinking spaces that continue to evolve. So we incorporate blogs, we incorporate podcasts, um, we incorporate lived experiences, and we take that information and we engage um, in dialogue with an, one another um, in a space where we have some community agreements of the way we will show up to create a safer space. We can't promise a safe space, a space of challenge um, and a space to show up as best as we feel we can as our true authentic selves so that we can actually learn from one another, listen to experiences 
and then incorporate what we have learned um, into our own understanding. Um, it's not an attempt to force a belief system or anything on folks but to create awareness. And then, and then it is our hope that um, there will be growth in that process um, across difference and within difference um, so that we can be in more community and um, be able to have uh, an increased understanding both for marginalized folks and folks that have historically been the folks that have held the power and not experienced depression. Um, so that um, it, it, is, it is a duality. It is not um, for you know one group or another. Although I will share that at times, um, I think I can say for we as facilitators do worry and be concerned that the spaces become um, a space that could do harm um, do more harm to marginalized folks because so often um, we as white folks do not or have not had that knowledge or done that work. And as you said, Mia, you know, our educational system has not raised us, um, most educational system has not raised us with this knowledge base. Um, and so we can oftentimes as white people come to this space not having had that knowledge or done the work. So sometimes the labor and the emotional toll and burden is different, and so that's our role as facilitators to take that on and and help guide um, all that are participating in that, so that it can be a, a valuable experience for for all who are participating in it. And Erin, what's the course code for that class? So EDHI three three eight, and then there's a letter associated with it, dependent upon um, the topic. And the reason why um, I the reason yeah. why I cringe, you know, as we say it, because the College of Education, which is where the course is housed, um, although ODI has um, responsibility for it, the um, the the prefix over there is changing. I think it might be oh, three thirty eight, but I, okay. I don't know if that's happening this fall or if it's happening in the spring. So either EDHI or CHSC three thirty eight, I think, is still the course though. I highly encourage our students to get involved with the intergroup dialogue program. And there's other programs across campus that have some dialogic uh, approaches and styles. Um, this one is a little different, but I know, I think Micah um, also houses um, a dialogic um, group um, and there's others on campus. Uh, it, it's one credit. It, it does take you your work and your effort. You have to show up. There is a um, uh, reflective uh, assignments and reading assignments, but then, you know, we, we expect to show up and be present in this space and engage with one another. Um, but I've never learned of a student who's participated in it, who has not found value in it, um, and experienced some, some level of understanding, knowledge, and growth. And quite often we find that the students are so engaged that they actually continue to take additional dialogues with other um, identity areas. Uh, that's that's just how valuable they found it. And, and we also, through the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, have had faculty staff dialogues as well. Um, I think those have tended to take in the summer and considering our change of space um, in COVID-19, I'm, I'm not faculty and staff on similar practices. Yeah, thank you, Erin, for, for mentioning that. I think that two things. We are thinking about a faculty staff dialogue this summer. Mm -hmm. um, we were just confirming that in our um, uh, staff meeting yesterday. Um, so there could be one for people to look out for. I think coming back, though, to the skill related part of it, what can people do, like thinking about the classroom? I want to highlight and really amplify a part of what Erin is saying is that um, for, for a lot of people, we might think that reflection is not necessarily, um, you know, it's not action, right? Um, but what we know, though, is that reflection is key to being able to um, inter engage in anti-racist work, right? Um, for a lot of people, having never thought about being, um, having never thought about being somebody who could do racist things or, or trying to say that I'm not a racist person, to be able to sit with and tolerate what comes up as you think about um, maybe racist statements or racist behaviors or racist ways of being that you have um, exhibited in the world, that's actually a lot of work. Right, um, it can it can take a real toll on a person. I've, I've worked with clients in therapies, even at our counseling center, and supervised cases where um, interns were working with folks. Um, that students who come into the knowledge of their own white racial being, or sort of like themselves as participating in a white racial system that oppresses other people, can be really unnerving for people. Right, and so it, it does. That is a lot of work. 
Um, unfortunately, we haven't required that work of white folks, um, generally speaking, in, in our country, right? So that's where a lot of the work comes in for people to be able to figure out how do I, so like deconstruct myself and then figure out how to build myself back up in order to be able to be a fully functioning person who would not continue to do these things and maybe even, hopefully even, become an anti-racist person out in the world as well. So going off of that, um, I know anti-racism was touched upon, but could we just go into detail about what does it mean to be anti-racist and how would you define being actively anti-racist and not just not racist or against racism? Yeah, so I'm going to put this screen up really quickly, and then um, Dr. smith and I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, I was looking around for a definition of anti-racism, and it was really actually hard to find something in higher ed um, to help us with this. So I kind of made up my own based upon the mm -hmm. definition that um, Dr. Kamara Jones um, shared with us. So I say anti-racism is behavior, and I think that's really something that we need to be trying to lean into. What are we doing about racism? But also it's about pursuing racial justice by naming, understanding, being accountable for, and providing remedies for the system of racial stratification that structures opportunity and assigns value, right? So how is it that we actively name racism as, as, a, as a problem? How is it that we speak to that? Because again, going off of Dean Lushniak's um, observation, we don't, that's a part of a racist system, not to talk about racism and how it shows up. So that becomes really important. How do we understand it, how it functions? Because it is a system that is always living and breathing among us. Um, then how do we take some accountability for that? How do I be accountable for how racism shows up in my classroom? How do I be accountable for how racism is taught um, to my kids, right? Um, how, do I, how do I try to um, subvert what's going on in classrooms as Dr. Mia smith Bannon was pointing out? And then how do I actively participate in being in providing some remedies for that, right? Um, so that we can disrupt these structures and these systems that um, really take away opportunity and really uh, assign value to white people as being so sort of like the supreme group in, in our society, right? Um, Dr. Smith Bynum, do you want to talk more about sort of like some, some ways of thinking about that in society? Yeah, um, let me, I'll, I'll kind of uh, jump onto the point that you made about parents. Um, so, um, when I, I did an interview with a Washington Post um, blogger focused on parenting, um, I think not long after the second election of former President Obama. And we had had a previous conversation um, prior to that. And then she came back to me later. This is a, a white um, mom who lives in the region um, who authored this. And she told me this story about um, how her two daughters were um, uh, um, coloring in a coloring book. And these were very young kids. Um, sort of reflects how early race uh, should be discussed um, in families, including uh, white American ones. So they were coloring um, uh, these, um, um, I guess, human figures in the book. And um, the younger daughter, who was probably three or four, said to her older sister, who's about five or six, what color should we color their skin? And um, the, the uh, older daughter said, um, white, we're lucky. And so what I said to, to the mom is that she didn't say we're better. She said, we're lucky. So these very young kids recognized white privilege and we're talking about that in a context of play. And so what this, this um, journalist said to me, she said, you know, because of our conversation, I went towards it and I had a conversation with my daughters about issues of race. And what I tell white parents is that when this stuff comes up, you don't have to have all the answers. In many ways, it's like a lot of parenting topics where you know, you read all the books and then your kid isn't in the book. Like, you know, you say to your, your, your kids and your, your, your family, whoever, hey, I, you know, I'm uncomfortable with that, but why don't we do some reading? Why don't we, like everyone's doing, why don't we order something on said favorite, you know, home delivery service? Um, I think you guys know which ones I'm talking about. Um, home delivery um, service and get some books um, out there. And one of the things that's happening that is amazing that I haven't seen in, in my lifetime is the sheer availability of lists to help um, all of us, including those of us who are parents to um, manage these kinds of things. And so I know that um, Kelly Blake, our communications associate dean has made some of those things available um, in the context of, of, this, of this conversation. But going towards it, that goes to what Dr. Green is talking about in terms of naming it, that just that the silence is the problem. 
And so not letting our anxiety, because we haven't talked about it, um, get in the way of that. Um, and there's a growing literature on how to raise your kids to be, as Dr. Kenny would, would call it, to be anti-racist. And so you make sure that you have a multicultural friendship network and, 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 you, and you're very intentional about the schools where your children go, the neighborhoods that you live in, because when they see um, uh, kids who look like them, kids of different skin colors and backgrounds and, and, um, and ethnicities and nationalities, that becomes their normal. And then um, the, the opportunity for prejudice to take root is much, 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 much lower because you're talking about their friends. And so kids need to see you living out your value systems and not saying, well, I'm colorblind, which actually doesn't work, um, or that um, I, you know, I don't see color or I'm not, or the favorite, I'm not a racist. But if you're living in essentially a bubble where everyone around you, everyone that you work with, everyone in your neighborhood, at your place of worship, they all are white American, you're sending a message to your kids around what kind of values they should have. What often happens with our institutions of higher ed is the, these places are often a cross section of the real world and they're bumping up against all these different ways of being in the world that are different and unfamiliar and that perhaps they've only been allowed to absorb societal stereotypes about. And so the way you break down these stereotypes is you expose kids in very different um, to them early and you talk about difference as opposed to running away from it. And then it becomes their normal. I think the thing that I would add to that as well, um, cause I do think that there is something about um, cross racial engagement that is really significant to this process, but it's also really important for white parents, white teachers, um, white principals, white lawmakers, right? Whoever you happen to be, to be thinking about how whiteness also operates, right? which is also one of the things that is really unnameable in this conversation. We wanna talk about race, we wanna talk about black people, we wanna talk about Native American people. We also have to figure out a way of talking about whiteness, right? And there are so many ways right now that people are writing about this. And so people can educate themselves in, in a lot of different ways, but how do we talk about whiteness as a real um, driver of this conversation? And what we know is that, you know, that there, there's literature out there about that, that, that I generally refer to as white supremacy culture um, that, that, that is not about, so like burning crosses, it's not about using the N word. Um, it's not about some of those pieces that we generally characterize as, as whiteness. It's really about the unspoken rules and practices and values that show up in, in our lives um, that actually help to keep whiteness and white supremacy culture and racism in place. Um, so silence really is one of those sort of like one of those, one of those values, silence about race. Um, that's a value that comes from white supremacy culture. It's certainly not a value in people of color communities. Like black people talk about race all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something that we do, whereas we know that white people tend not to talk about race in really substantive ways, right? Um, or even to be thinking about how do you, um, even right now, thinking about, uh, about the uprisings and rebellions that are occurring across the country, right? We, we, we see people out marching in the street and, we, and there is some appreciation for um, folks uh, chanting Black Lives Matter. And the moment that a looting incident uh, occurs, right, or, or there is some rioting, people will engage in the conversation and say, see, this is why we can't support this because, you know, Black people are looting now, right? Um, an anti-racist perspective would really shift that and say, let's um, what this looting actually means, right? And let's not get lost on the looting and not focus on the loss of Black lives that that's occurred, right? How do we reshift the focus on really on the people of color who are dying or who are being killed by the police, right? The white supremacy culture actually teaches us to be focused on property and productivity, right? And so that's why we think about, well, what's happening at Target with the, with the lamps that are going out or the, the shoes that are coming out of that, that Nike store, right? How do we focus not on those, those, that type of property and be focused on the real, the real issue here? which is about the loss of black lives or the murdering of black lives and black bodies. Yeah. And I would add on to that to quote um, Robin D'Angelo, who's the writer of um, the book entitled White Fragility, which is selling like hotcakes right now. She says there's more than one type of looting. So wealth inequality and things that happen with our policy is a type of looting that happens, but it's done under the cover of law. So people maybe get upset about it, but because um, a largely white um, uh, uh, American um, 
uh, 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 um, um, governmental structures, right? That the policies are put into place. And so when you see some of these, um, these uprisings, these protests that are happening, that it's that um, when you have things like that and voter suppression and like what's happening in Georgia right now, that these are all manifestations of structural racism and classism and so on and so forth. So it's almost the system, it, it, it gets to a point where it bursts open, right? And so a lot of that behavior um, that in one frame, it certainly can, can be considered problematic. But when you think about the um, vast array of, of, of um, unequal opportunity structures, that um, no system can really sustain that um, indefinitely for very long. And so I just want to talk about that. It's all connected. When people don't have enough legitimate pathways of access to due process under the law or to expressing themselves through voting, it's human beings, it is going to come out one way or another. Yeah, well, I think I forget where I was or talking about Absolutely. that. I'm just thinking about um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's quote, right? That the uh, riot is the language of the unheard, mm -hmm. right? Um, so people are communicating with, with that information, right? So how do we take a step back and re really interpret that differently than just assigning sort of like this language or this narrative of violence, right? Mm -hmm. We don't, we have not assigned a language or narrative of violence mm -hmm. to the Boston Tea Party, right? we actually extol the Boston Tea Party as being a crucial aspect of the founding of the, founding of the, of the American nation, right? But in some ways, that could be considered looting by current standards, but nobody would ever talk about that in a classroom as such, right? Um, I think that, you know, even, even as, we, as we focus on, I, I, maybe, maybe that's my suggestion, like back up and ask a different question versus the question that, that we asked that sort of like pejorative, um, makes black people or people of color seem like they are really negative. Let's talk about the system, systems that are operating the way Dr. Mason McBinem is, is referring to them. Thank you for talking about the systems. And that actually brings us into some of the questions that are submitted by listeners. We have a bunch of questions, which is very exciting, um, but one question um, was submitted by Bill Coles, and he says, here's a question that has bothered me for a while. What steps will the university take to one, embed an understanding of equity and diversity into our curriculum across disciplines, undergrad and grad? And two, train all faculty to teach and co-learn with our students. And three, to establish a cultural expectation that all faculty engage in learning and teaching about equity and diversity issues in their own field. And I just, I just want to say I love that he brought up co-learn with our students. Um, that's something that I, I did not mention, but I was thinking about in terms of facilitation. That every time I engage in a facilitated course or dialogue. I am continually learning in that process too. And yes, our students are here to learn from us and, and to create that space, but we are all in a space of learning and all in a space of growth. And so I very much appreciate um, that, that language that was shared there too. So I just want to add that. Yeah. And let me put in also, you know, as the dean, you know, it, it really is, it's a whole different world out there, right? Because as the dean, the expectation is, you know, if I have a faculty member from behavioral community health or, or from biostatistics, right? The expectation is you know everything there is to know about it and you will teach that next generation. Here, what we're talking about is something that none of us are expert at, right? The world shows us, right? You know, the fact is that from, from 1619 to now in this history, we've not gotten it right. So how dare I assume that a professor knows more than a student about this. And I, I can't emphasize enough is that what this wakes us up to, and I, I don't have an answer, Kelly, of what the pathway needs to be, but it's gotta be a co-responsibility here, right? It has to be a student working, you know, the freshman working with the most seasoned, um, with the most seasoned uh, professor. Were you gonna say something, Mia? No, go. I was I was just um, meditating on the uh, um, a, a university where we're top to bottom. It's a it's a work in process, and mm -hmm. I will say one of the things that's happening in our college that's been very organic and from the ground up is that you know our colleagues are 
um, uh, sponsoring reading groups for some of the highly recommended texts where, because um, the first part has to be the deep work where you do the self-reflective work. And so um, we are organizing a reading group in my department. I know that um, a family science is not the only one. And so I think from a grassroots standpoint, which is what I'm most familiar with, those are the kinds of things that I think um, uh, is the first step. And then, um, and then to do that in partnership with the formal leaders, formal leadership on the campus, I think is, 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 is a part two of that. So I'll let, let you speak, Carl. Yeah, I was going to say that I think that, you know, um, some recognition, which I think that um, you are all pointing to, is that higher education was not necessarily started with people of color in mind, right? Higher education was founded with white, heterosexual, mostly middle class, Christian men in mind. And so if we go back to this notion that it's baked into the walls, right, the way that um, Dr. Miss smith Bynum was pointing to, like, like higher education in and of itself is a racist system. And I think that what Bill is pointing to is that how do we bring some recognition to that, which would then, if, if we can have honest conversation about that, if we can tell some truth about that, then maybe we can begin to shift and think about what would it look like for us all to be responsible for thinking about how to do um, inclusion at the institution and all hold some responsibility for that, right? Right now at this institution, and this may get a little controversial, I hope I don't lose my job, right? Um, so we, we have this Office of, Diver of Diversity and Inclusion, which is highly under-resourced and highly underfunded. Um, with, if we think about uh, an institution where there are 40,000 students or almost 60,000 people in our community, how is it that we would think about doing this work across the campus with an office of the size of the way that we have it? We've got to have more resources to be able to do that. and. We've also got to be thinking about how do we partner as co-learners, which I think Bill, Bill's word is really right, as co-learners across the institution so that we're not only looking towards leadership for how this work is done, although leadership's vision is really important, we also empower people from the grassroots level to be thinking about informing that vision and being co-participants in creating that vision as we move forward, right? Um, and that in and of itself is a radical way of doing things because higher education has really been a top-down organization. The shift would really require us to share power across the institution to be able to disrupt some of these structures that really um, afford opportunity to certain groups and deny it to others. Thank you so much for sharing that. And then Back to Dr. Green, um, this question was submitted specifically to you from Olivia Carter Pocross. She was wondering if you could tell us more about your upcoming training, Academics for Black Survival and Wellness Week. <laughs> sure, that's was one of the things I wanted to talk about as a takeaway. Um, and it's, I should say this, it is not my initiative. It is actually an initiative that has been started by two black women who are at the University of Florida. One is a young assistant professor whose name is Della Mosley. And um, she's, I think, in the second year of her, her tenure or her role there as a tenure track faculty person. In addition to her, one of her graduate students, Paris Bellamy, um, a, a young black woman who is in Dr. Della's um, uh, lab there. What they are doing is um, really responding to their own or sort of like the, the hearing of the collective pain that black people have been experiencing in academic departments across the country. And so what they what they've really done in a week's time, which is amazing, is organized a um, a, a system, organized a, a learning mechanism, such that academics, whether or not you are a black ac academic or a non-black ac academic, can participate in a, in a week-long program. And we're trying to dis uh, uh, develop the curriculum for it right now to get people to understand how anti-blackness, anti-black racism functions in higher education so that we can all come to terms about what that means, how it affects black bodies, how it, affect, how it affects non-black bodies, and then how we can develop some, some um, practice for moving forward. Um, there's going to be a way of, of, of having work going on for just almost like four to six hours a day where you're doing it independently, right? Um, but then at the end of the day, you're meeting with an accountability group um, across the country in different um, uh, time zones um, to be able to, to talk about this. One of the things that we know that's really important for this work is, um, and I say this all the time on my campus, if you can't talk about something, you can't think about something, right? And so to be in community with other people um, who are holding you accountable for rooting out the anti-Blackness that's occurring in academia um, is one of the things that those accountability groups will be focusing on. 
here on our campus, we're gonna push this out um, so that maybe academics here can begin to participate in it. And there's a sign up on the academicforblacklives.org website where people can participate in this week long initiative that's gonna start next week. And then yesterday in my staff meeting, we were talking about how it is that if we do have people participate on our campus, we'll try to pull together that community of people who participated in it to think about how do we garner some of the energy, some of the reflection, some of the learning from our local folks to actually begin to try and grow this movement on our campus, right? So how is it that we are really moving in favor of protecting black lives and promoting health and wellness for black people? And I really wanna say this part too. Over the course of the past two weeks here in the uh, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, along with some partners across campus, we've held some listening spaces for um, people to come in and talk about how this current COVID-16-19 is affecting them. One of the things that has struck me repeatedly in these spaces that I've been a part of is that I've listened to two different groups of Black women talk about their experiences on this campus of feeling disconnected feeling marginalized, um, feeling like their voices are silenced and feeling really put upon to do a lot of the work around uh, race on our campus to the degree that, that black women in particular are feeling particularly exhausted and burnt out. I think that that's something that we need to be thinking about as an institution, right? How is it that we um, think about preparing or, or, or providing for uh, the black women on our campus who do a lot of emotional labor for caring for our black student population, for advocating for anti-justice, I mean, um, anti-racist work, for doing racial justice work. How do we care for them, right? In this moment where they are caring for a lot of people, what do we need to do for them? And so that's also a piece of that that we wanna be considering even with this Academics for Black Lives piece going forward. Thank you so much for sharing about that. I am excited to potentially attend it if I, am able to, that sounds really fascinating. Um, but just kind of wrapping it up and bringing us back together, I was wondering if each of you could just share a few key takeaways like from our discussion today. And yeah, I think, yes, if we could leave it out a few takeaways, that would be amazing. Oh, I guess I'll start. Um, the first one for folks who are, um, really experiencing our time in this moment and really um, giving some key self-reflection. Like, I'm no historian, but I think we are in a pivot point um, in our country's history. There's something distinct about this um, uh, compared to what um, the 19, 1968, where there was a lot of um, upheaval in the United States, the multiracial nature of the protests, the, the, the sustainability of it, the um, breadth of it, it's an international protest. This is very meaningful. And what I would, um, uh, for folks who are watching, say to take what you've heard today, what you've learned over the past week, and to continue to build upon it. All of these things, it's a lifelong journey. And so um, uh, we get weary. And that is part of the lived experience. And so to, to stay with the process, meet the people of color in your lives, the Black students, the Black colleagues, in their full humanity, because that's what this is really all about. And to see color, because that is to see me and who I am. I am a black woman. When I'm not in these spaces, I speak black English, just like many of my friends and family. And um, that's a, just a different way of being. Meet people in those spaces. And as some of my best um, uh, white male mentors have done over my career, get curious. Get curious. Meet them on their level and say, huh. I don't know everything. Could you mind telling me more about that? And when that trust is there, some of the um, most rewarding uh, professional friendships I've had have been across racial lines. And so um, what a shame to retire and to not have received some of that. And so that's what I would leave folks with. I appreciate that, Mia. I'm, I'm gonna echo some of that and build on that. And, and my, my message uh, first or takeaway is, Show up with care. Show up with the vulnerability of your own self and care for those around you. And in particular, Black people and people of color. And um, and know that that is a radical space too. Um, and especially for white people to do that. And that we are in action and we are moving to action, but showing up in the space of feeling 
and care and conversation is not um, less than showing up in a space of action and policy and um, and taking you know that that area of activism. Um, and I'm finding there's like this dichotomy or disparity or something there, where, where in particular white folks are having a hard time in engaging with that. And that um, and and we can do all of those things. We can do all of those things. But if we show up in those spaces of activism um, without the care, it's not authentic um, and it's not meaningful. And in particular, it's not meaningful for folks of color and they don't feel seen and they don't feel heard. Um, and, and, and that's what I'm seeing and hearing from um, Black folks in our community in the school of public health and, and, and on, on campus. And I, I want to um, echo that and support that and center that. I think I just want to close out with a few um, takeaways that are really concrete um, that, I, that I wanted to make sure that I talked about. Um, oh, my screen is a little weary there. Um, let's go here. So, you know, I talked a little bit about self-reflection. I'm going to lift up this book from my advisor, you know, so full disclosure, this is my doctoral advisor, Dr. Janet e. Helms. A Race is a Nice Thing to Have is a workbook for people to really understand white racial identity. You see the title there, A Guide to Being a White Person or Understanding the White Persons in Your Life, where she really lays out white racial identity development theory in a really accessible way with activities in the book for people to walk through and really do some self-reflection around. Uh, one of the things that, um, that we know is that a lot of the work that's being done right now in uh, around sort of like white anti-racism actually is born out of white racial identity development theory, right? So go to the source here. Dr. Jenny D. Helms is one of the ways that people can be thinking about doing that. You can order this book um, online. The other piece I've already kind of talked about, the Academics for Black Lives, um, uh, Academics for Black Survival and Wellness. You can go to this academicsforblacklives.com website in order to be able to sign up. One of the things that I did not mention that I would be remiss if I didn't is that not only is there a track for non-Black people, there's also a track for Black people to participate in a week of thinking about how do you rest and learn more about how do you take care of yourself, take care of your own Black life as what as non-Black people are doing work around sort of like how do we root out anti-Blackness, right, in the, in the context of academia. And then the last thing that I would say that I, I don't, I can't believe that I didn't, um, didn't think about this is um, tomorrow we'll be kicking off a series that will feature um, Dr. Mia Smith-Bynum, um, from the School of Public Health, Dr. Roger Worthington from the Center for Diversity and Higher Education, um, Dr. Cindy Stevens, who was a um, business professor in, uh, in the School of Business, and Dr. Janelle Wong, who was over in um, American Studies. And we're going to be starting a virtual um, anti-racism teaching series. And tomorrow we're going to just kind of lay out, so like our, our vision and hopes for, for doing this series throughout the summer, and we'll see what happens from there. But really we're inviting campus experts into this conversation people who are doing practice, people who are writing about this, people who are talking to other people about this across the nation so that they can bring to bear their own perspectives on anti-racism from their own work um, into our campus community. Um, hopefully what we'll see is that, you know, we're, we're about to move into a new era here at the university with a new African-American president at the institution. So this is a great opportunity for us to be thinking about how do we support Dr. Pines? How do we help Dr. Pines to be successful um, in his tenure here, thinking about specifically how anti-Blackness could get in the way of his, uh, of his tenure, right? So how do we um, get on board um, in advance and name anti-Blackness as something that could come, out, come up as a barrier to his success, right, um, moving forward? So I invite people to join us tomorrow um, at noon um, for that conversation. You can go to the ODI webpage or the UM, hashtag UMD Solidarity webpage to, to register for that conversation. Great. And, and Kelly, let me, before I hand off sort of the concluding statement to you, because we do also want to know what your reflections are, Kelly, as one of our students. Uh, let me sort of, uh, sort of, my reflections are on two realms, one of which is I was really captivated, Dr. Green, by the, the definition of racism that, that you, 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 know, you introduced today uh, from a par former American Public Health Association past president. And, and Dr. Smith Bynum, when you talked about racism being in the walls, right, gives me a sense that it, this isn't easy, right? If it's built into the walls, you know, this is now a, a problem that is doable, 
uh, it, 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 in terms of tackling it, but it's going to take a whole lot more effort even than we've seen since 1619 till now, right? I mean, this is, this is critical. I also reflect on this idea of what, of, you know, it, it's come up on, on more than one occasion that, that racism is a public health issue. And so the School of Public Health, when we look at, right, the alignment of the situations that have occurred in these last few months, I keep saying that nobody wished COVID-19 upon the world, but it happened. And now our obligation, not only in public health, but as a humanity in general, is to learn the lessons from COVID-19 so that we get better and that we tackle emerging threats. At the same time, the alignment is nobody asks the death of George Floyd upon our society, but it happened. And it's almost the same reaction, which is let's learn from this. Let's not just go back and have a bunch of marches and then a few weeks from now say, okay, it's out of our system, Lao, let's carry on. Both these are obligations, these terrible tragic events, and then add myriad others, right? This is just recent times, myriad others. And let's, you know, put in that sense of this is going to take a lot of work, but there has to be a change. There needs to be a change. We mandate a change and we need to be part of that change. Back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Dean Lushniak. And I, I think some of my biggest takeaways from today is talking about empathy and caring for one another during this time. Um, because lots of, like, initially, I had the perception that if you're not loud, then you're not doing anything. And then just like understanding that there are so many ways to be an activist and an ally and just understanding people. And I, that really excites me. Also hearing a bunch of just mentors and people older than me talk about co-learning and just having that be at the forefront and something that we need to do a lot more in our next steps and like let me get back onto campus and everything and all the weeks before that I think that's a very exciting period to be a part of and then also it's just a very genuine environment where people can express what they're feeling or what they know and just address those different disparities in a new light. But thank you all for being a part of this Facebook Live today. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. And thank you everyone who joined in, asked questions, and just learned during our discussion. Thank you. Thank you.